Hey everybody, Mr. Judson here. So to, we're starting chapter three now, and what we're doing is we're, we're starting to analyze graphs. Our, our ultimate goal here is to be able to take an equation and draw a pretty accurate graph with it. Using some of the things we learned back in pre-calculus and, and also some things uh, uh, using the derivative as well. So one thing we need to make sure we understand is if, if I have a function on a, a given interval, so not the entire function, just part of it, um, we've already said that this point right here is called a relative maximum. It, it means relative to this area, that's the high spot. And, and down here we've got a relative minimum. Well, one thing that, uh, that a lot of books talk about in, in central Washington um, focuses on is what's the absolute maximum or absolute minimum. We're still going to be interested in relative maximums and minimums, um, but if I look at this graph and I say where's the absolute minimum, well, this is the absolute lowest point on this given interval. So I would say that this point right here is the absolute minimum. That point's lower than this one over here. So for the whole graph, where is that lowest point going to occur? Um, where's the absolute maximum? Well, since this point right here is higher than this one, that's the absolute highest point on, on the graph. So this is our absolute maximum and our relative maximum. Okay, and that's one of the main focuses for today is being able to find those. So overall, um, we would call these points the extrema of this graph. Okay, and what extrema means is where are the extremes? Well, this is kind of an extreme high for this area, this is an extreme low, but that's our extreme lowest point right there. That's our extreme highest point. And they all kind of fall underneath the, the category of, of extrema. Um, our book is going to ask us to find the absolute extrema in the homework problems for today. So one of the, one of the key ideas that, that we want to work with when we talk about the extrema is, you know, how do you find these points, these relative maximums and minimums? And, you know, we now have the derivative to help us out. We know that if we were to draw a tangent line right there, the derivative would have to be zero. And so these, things, these relative maximums and relative minimums, they occur when our derivative equals zero. All right? So let's go ahead and try a sample problem. All right, so we've got a function here. And uh, the directions are going to say to find the absolute extrema of this function. Well, that means I need to, first of all, figure out where my high and low spots are. Relative maximums, relative minimums, using the derivative. But then also I just need to check the endpoints to see if those get a little bit higher or a little bit lower than those relative maximums and minimums. So my first step is going to be to do this. I'm going to find the derivative, which isn't bad. I've got 12x cubed minus 12x squared. I then have to set that equal to 0 because that's where your horizontal tangents occur, right? This is now a slope. Where do we get a slope of 0? So 12x cubed minus 12x squared equals 0. I'll factor a 12x squared out of both of those, and I'm left with x minus 1. So that means that my critical values, that's what they call them in calculus, critical numbers, where your derivative equals 0, um, would be at 0 and 1. So critical numbers at x equals 0 and 1. It's just where the derivative equals 0. Okay? That's where your horizontal tangents would occur, and so if there is a relative maximum or minimum, that's where it's at. Okay? But what we need to do now is see where's the absolute 
maximum or minimum. So what I want to do is I want to go back and plug these numbers into my original function to see what y values I get. I also want to plug in the endpoints of our interval. So I want to figure out what's, let's see, if I start at negative 1, what's f of negative 1? What's f of 0? What's f of 1? And what's f of 2? So these are where my maxims or relative maxims and minimums should occur. And I'm just checking the outer points of the interval to see if the graph gets a little higher or lower. I don't have to graph this. I just have to know what the y values are. So if I plug a negative 1 into here, I'm going to get a positive 1 times 3. Here I'll get a negative 1 times negative 4. That'll be a positive 4. So 3 plus 4, that's 7. If I plug a 0 in, I get 0. If I plug in a 1, I'm going to get 3 minus 4. That equals a negative 1. And if I plug in a 2, I'm going to get 2 to the 4th. That's 16 times 3, that's 48. Here I'm going to get 2 to the 3rd, that's 8, times 4, that's 32. So 48 minus 32, that would be 16. So right here I have my absolute minimum, and here's my absolute maximum. I suppose if you just did that, we've, we've answered the question. Um, sometimes people like to make sure their answer is a little bit clear, so we could say there's an absolute minimum of negative 1 at x equals 1, and there's an absolute maximum of 16 when x equals 2. Okay, we'll have to see how the back of the book an answers that, but that would be a, a, probably a clearer answer than this right here is. All right, let's try another one. All right, so before we do this one, I want to I back up and, and do just a, a slightly better job of defining something. Um, when I said critical numbers, this would be any place where your derivative equals 0 or where it's undefined. Those are considered critical values, okay? So critical numbers would be where f prime of x equals 0 or where f prime of x is undefined, okay? Where the derivative is undefined, not the original function. Those are critical numbers, and that's important to to keep this in mind, um, because some of the work that we have to do in this chapter, we're going to need to pay attention to that. Okay, And then your absolute extrema have to happen at one of the critical numbers or at the endpoints of that interval. Okay. All right, so let's, let's try this one. Okay. I want you to find the absolute extrema just like we did in the last one, for this function, on the interval 0 to 3. You guys go ahead and try it. Alright, so step one, got to find the derivative. 6x squared minus 6. Then I want to set that equal to 0 and solve. I'll go ahead and factor a 6 out as I'm doing this. Um, difference of two squares, so x plus 1 times x minus 1. And so my critical numbers are wherever that derivative equals 0. That would be at x equals positive 1 and negative 1. And so now I just need to check the y values at those two values and the interval. Um, actually, I'm not going to try negative 1, am I? It's outside of the interval. So really, I just have to do f of 0, f of 1, f of 3. I'll plug those back into the original function and see what I get. 
So if I plug in a zero, I get zero. I guess this would be an, another real important point to make sure we get. Anytime you're looking for points on a graph, you have to make sure and go back to the original function. That hasn't changed since the beginning of you know, pre-algebra. If you want to find points on a graph, you go back to the original function. If we want to look at what the slope is doing, that's when we plug into the derivative. So we don't want to make that mistake of plugging into this function. Got to go back to the original. If I plug in a 1, I'm going to get 2 minus 6. That would be a negative 4. And if I plug in a 3, I've got, oh boy, let's see, 3 cubed, that would be 27. Times 2, that's 54. Minus 18, that would be 36. 54 minus 18, yeah, 36. So there's my absolute minimum, there's my absolute maximum. If I wrote it the other way that we said, uh, we could say there's an absolute minimum of negative 4 at x equals 1, and an absolute maximum of 36. See, we're referring to the y values here when we look for the minimum or maximum. And then we say where that occurs, at x equals 3. All right, let's try one that'll make us think just a little bit more. Oh, really? Fractional exponents? Uh -huh. All right, let's give it a try. The process doesn't change, even when the numbers get ugly. All right, so f prime of x is going to equal 2. Uh, when I bring that down and multiply, I'm going to get a negative 2x, and then I've got to subtract 1. Um, so that's going to give me a negative one-third. And I want to set that equal to zero and solve. So let's see. If I imagine this equal to zero, I'd move this to the other side so it would become a positive term. And this would have to become one over x to the one-third, which is the same as a cube root. Okay? So I'll divide both sides by two. That means we've got 1 equals 1 over the cube root of x. And the only way that's going to equal 1 is if this equals 1, right? I mean, I'm just looking at going 1 divided by what equals 1. It's got to be 1 divided by 1. So I've got to make that whole thing equal to 1. I could just bring this over here and multiply and say the cube root of x equals 1. And then if I go ahead and solve... For that, I would cube both sides and get x equals 1. So I guess that wasn't that bad. It looked a little scary. Um, so now that's my only critical number. It is undefined at 0, right? If I look at this, the derivative, when you bring that down into the denominator, you know, before I even move anything, 2 minus 2 over cube root of x. It is undefined at 0, so that would also be a critical number. I need to just double check and, and see what happens. Okay? So I'm just going to make a note here that critical numbers equal 1 and 0. So I'm going to do f of negative 1, my first endpoint. Then I've got f of 0, f of 1 and f of 3. Now some people might say, well why would you plug in a 0, Judson, because it's undefined. Well I'm not plugging 0 into this part. I'm plugging it into the original function. It may still be undefined there, but it may not be. Okay? So we'll just check it out and see. Alright, so if I plug in a negative 1, so you put a negative 1 there and square it, you get a positive 1. Take the cube root of 1, that's 1. So I've got negative 3 here. I've got negative 2 here. Negative 2 minus 3, that would be a negative 5. 
Plug in a zero, you get zero minus zero. Plug in a one, I've got two. One raised to anything is one, so two minus three, that's a negative one. And then plug in a three. I'll get six, let's see if I put a three there. I've got to square that. Then take the cube root times three. I don't know what that answer is. That's gonna be a decimal answer. All right, so let me just pull up a calculator and check that. Um, if I do two times three, that's gonna be six minus three times. I'll just do three raised to the two thirds. So in parentheses, three raised to the in parentheses two divided by three. Okay. And there we go, a negative 0 0.240. So a negative 0 0.240. Um, it's not the smallest negative number, that right there is, so I don't have to worry about rounding. This is going to be my absolute minimum. And this is going to be my absolute maximum. Zero, it's the largest value. So I'll just go down here and say there is an absolute maximum of zero at x equals zero and an absolute minimum of negative five at x equals, that was at negative one. There we go. All right, we've got one more to try. Yeah, we gotta do it. We gotta throw a trig, trig equation in here. So, um, same question. Find the absolute extrema of this function on the interval zero to two pi. You guys go ahead and try it. All right, so let's see, I'm going to find the derivatives, so let's see, yeah, y prime is going to be 2 cosine of x. Uh, derivative of a cosine is a negative sine, so plus sine of 2x times the derivative of the angle, which is 2. And so I, I need to set that equal to 0 and solve. So. You know, first thing um, I got to realize here is that my angles aren't the same, and so really this is not an easy equation to solve. Unless I can change this using my double angle formula. So sine of 2x is equal to 2 sine of x cosine of x. And, and I think we want to make that change um, right here just to make this a little bit easier. So we're going to say that this is 2 cosine of x plus that 2 out in front times that 2, that's 4, sine of x, cosine of x, and I want to set that equal to 0 and solve. So we did do some of this last year in, in pre-calc. Um, when you're solving a trig function, you, you want to factor it. And, and all I really care about is that each individual factor has to have just one trig function in it. I prefer to have just one trig function overall, but if I can't get that, at least to the point where each factor has only one trig function. So I can factor a 2 cosine of x out of each of these terms. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'm left with a 1 here plus 2 sine of x equals zero. And the only way I can multiply this times this and get zero is either this has to equal zero, right? So I'm not worried about the two, I just need the cosine of x to equal zero, or this whole thing has to equal zero. So if I move that one to the other side, it becomes negative, and then I'll divide by two, I get sine of x has to equal a negative one half. And, and so now I just need to figure out where did these two things happen on the unit circle? All right? 
just to make uh, life easy for us, we'll just pop out a unit circle here real quick to stare at. So where does the cosine equal zero? That's my x-coordinate. That's going to happen here and here. And, and remember, we're only going around the unit circle once, 0 to 2 pi. Okay, so pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. And where does the sine equal a negative 1 half? Sine is negative down here. There's one spot right there at 7 pi over 6. And the other one's at... 11 pi over 6. Alright, so I'm going to go from 0 to 2 pi. So I need to figure out what f of 0 is. f of the first angle I'll hit is this one, pi over 2. Um, the next angle I hit is this one, so f of 7 pi over 6. Next angle I hit is 3 pi over 2. And then I'll hit 11 pi over 6. And then I hit 2 pi. All right, so got a lot of angles. We got to plug back into this function and see what we get. That's the way it is, right? All right, so if I plug in a zero first, let me just rewrite this so I don't have to keep on going back and forth. 2 sine of x minus cosine of 2x. All right, there's my original function. So if I put a zero in here, sine of zero is zero. Let's bring this down here so we can still use it. Sine of 0 is 0 times 2, that's 0. If I put a 0 in here, I get 0. Cosine of 0 is 1, so I get a negative 1. Then I'll plug in pi over 2. Sine of pi over 2 is 1 times 2, that's 2. Let me just write it down. Minus, uh, if I put a pi over 2 in here, the 2's cancel, I get pi. So the cosine of pi is negative 1. So minus a negative 1 means we're adding that, we get 3. 7 pi over 6, so the sine of 7 pi over 6 is a negative 1 half times 2, that's a negative 1. Put 7 pi over 6 in here, you double it, you would get um, 7 pi over 3. Right, 14, 14 pi over 6, which reduces down to 7 pi over 3. So there's 3 pi over 3, 6 pi over 3, 7 pi over 3. And the value of the cosine is 1 half. We're subtracting that. So I get a negative 1.5. 3 pi over 2. Sine of that is negative 1 times 2. Put 3 pi over 2 here, the 2's cancel, so I get 3 pi. That means go all the way around once and then halfway around. So I end up right here. So the cosine of that is a negative 1. And again, we're going to subtract a negative, uh, subtract a negative number, which means we'll add that. So a negative 2 plus 1, that's negative 1. 11 pi over 6. <laughs> Sine of 11 pi over 6 is a negative 1 half times 2. We start out with a negative 1. If I put that in right here, I get 22 pi over 6, which reduces down to um, 11 pi over 3. So I'd go 3 pi over 3, 6 pi over 3, 9 pi over 3, 10, 11 right there. 11 pi over 3. And what's the cosine of that? That would be 1 half. I'm subtracting that. So what I get is a negative 1.5 again. So right now it looks like I've got an absolute minimum in two different locations. 
Now I'll plug in 2 pi. Sine of 2 pi is 0 times 2, that's 0. Put a 2 pi in here and double it, you get 4 pi. That means I'm going to go around twice and end up there. And I want the negative of the cosine value, so I get a negative 1. So here's my absolute maximum. Here's my absolute minimum, which also happened here. So it means that absolute minimum occurred at two different uh, places. So let's write that out. I've got an absolute maximum of 3 at pi over 2. And I've got an absolute minimum of negative 1.5 at x equals 7 pi over 6 and 11 pi over 6. And it, it you know, it'd be really easy to check this and see if we're, if we're doing things right. We would just graph this on the graphing calculator. Not this, but the original function. Okay, we graph this. I would only graph it from 0 to 2 pi. Make that your interval. Um, probably put a tick mark every... I kind of want to see where these occur at, so... <sighs> Do I do it every pi over 6? Yeah, why not? Put a tick mark every pi over 6, and you know we should be able to see where that happens at. All right, that's what we have for today, you guys. Um, just finding absolute maximums and minimums. Let me get you guys an assignment. All right, here we go. This is our Thursday version. I know we got a test today, but um, you know if you guys started today, that's great. If if you decide to put it off until maybe tomorrow or Saturday, I understand. Uh, but page 171, we're going to do 9, 17, 21, 25, 27, 31, and 39. All right, that's it. You guys take care, stay safe, have a good weekend, and uh, we'll see you next week. Bye.